All right, guys, welcome back to a new episode of the Grand Prairie PD podcast. It's a special episode today, although I think most of them are kind of getting to where they're they're pretty special. We're here today with a uh, Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent in Charge, Eduardo A. Chavez. Eduardo, I appreciate you sitting down no, with us. No, it's great to be here. I appreciate the invite. We were uh, we were actually just sitting down having a conversation about uh, how Narcos is completely legit and everything <laughs> happens exactly how it was on camera. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Great technical expertise there. <laughs> uh, so you're you're a pretty big deal, right? For a lot of people who don't know what special special agent in charge is, that's, uh, that's not a small thing. Look, just listen to the name, right. special agent in charge. I'm gonna tell you what to do. It has like six that's letters in, in his acronym. In, in charge, right? That's always a thing. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Now you know. I mean, uh, the area that we serve, you know, has we we basically have about 500 people, you know, in the North Texas and Oklahoma area. You oh, wow. know, so in that sense, it's a it's a big responsibility. Okay. You know, I don't know how much of a big deal it is. I try not to take myself uh, too seriously, right? You know, but overall, you know, it's a big responsibility, uh, not only for the the people we're trying to protect, you know, but the community we serve. Mm-hmm. Well, and from the the limited knowledge that I have about the kind of the drug trade, just geographically speaking, I imagine that investigating that particular area has a very wide-ranging effect on the rest of the country just because I know the central area tends to act as a distribution hub. Yeah, it's a beast. You know, you look at it um, for the same reason that a lot of multinational corporations have their hubs here or mm-hmm. headquarters or even transportation industries have their their hubs at the airports or whatnot. I mean, honestly, it's the same thing for drug trafficking. You know, they look at it just like uh, the same way a, a legitimate company might look at it and say, centrally speaking, where can we have some sort of operational uh, satellite, you know, outside of Mexico or outside of Central or South America mm-hmm. right. in, in order to be able to uh, get our product where it needs to go. Right. So in that sense, uh, the DFW area is extremely vital for what is unfortunately the, the illicit drug trade. Now, whenever, obviously, you're talking about legitimate businesses moving their products, uh, they're obviously, they're, they're using uh, by road, rail, air, oh, everything. Um, yeah, kind of combination yeah. of everything thereof. Do you see the same thing with, with drugs, or is it kind of more centralized somewhere? We'll Absolutely. I mean, by and large, you know, everything is, is more road-based, mm-hmm. right? You know, private vehicles, commercial vehicles, tractor trailers, things like that, you know, just because... You know, with the airports, with security, it just makes it a little harder. Right. You know, um, you have you have a certain degree. You know, buses and trains. You know, there's a little less scrutiny on baggage and passengers and things like that. You know, but even with the airlines, you know, you'd be surprised what people try and and get through TSA. Really. You know, to get on a plane. You know, and so regardless, you know, we've we've got our fingers in all of that because i think one of the biggest weaknesses of drug trafficking is the product has to get from point a to point b correct yeah. and with drugs like uh fentanyl drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine mm-hmm. uh, a lot of that is not well cocaine is not produced in this country right at you know, all at, at all. all you know right. there are no cocaine labs uh sitting off you know in in some corner of north texas or even in the in the us it's just not there yeah so again you got to get it one one place to another and so you've got to take that risk in transportation yeah. of how you're going to get it from, you know, crossing the border uh, to, you know, the, the user, yeah. you know, who wants, uh, you know, wants it for their, their party, party. Yeah. you know, somewhere in, um, in Dallas or in Chicago or New York. Yeah. So this is my knowledge of it. So when it comes across, let's say it's coming through South Texas. Sure. But by the time it gets to the northern states, Michigan, has the price doubled, tripled? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, one of my previous assignments, I was assigned in Mexico City, mm-hmm. right? So, oh, wow. you know, the belly of the beast a lot of times for DEA yeah. is agents who are assigned in Colombia or agents who are assigned in, in Mexico. Yeah. You know, so a lot of us are a little glutton for punishment. You know, we want to go where the action is. Sure. And it was always amazing to me uh, at the time I was there, which was in the early 2000s, is the price of a of a kilo okay. of methamphetamine in Guadalajara, which essentially right off the lab, right fresh off the the press, so to speak, yeah. to even the price in Tijuana, right at the border, okay, and then the price in San Diego, okay, literally just across, just the, across river, the river, right? So, 
you know, back then, uh, you know, a kilo of meth at the time, and the prices have so changed drastically. <laughs> but a kilo of meth in Guadalajara was like five hundred dollars. Get out of here. Then you'd get to Tijuana, and it would be like fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars. Yeah. But it would get to San Diego, and it would jump up to seven or eight thousand instantly. Wow. And that was because, again, just like anything else, a lot of these transportation guys are saying, hey, what's in it for me? Right. I'm taking all the risk to get it across the border. So to your point, that same kilo up in Michigan, you know, once it would get through that, now you're talking upwards of $20,000 for the same reason. Because they're saying, I'm risking 10 plus years minimum in, in prison mm-hmm. to get it from San Diego to Detroit. So Man. I need my cut. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you you just said something that kind of brings in one question I had. Uh, you know, we always talk about how, like, civilians watch TV and that's kind of how they get their impression of law sure. enforcement. Right. We do the same thing when there's, <laughs> like, when there's somebody that we don't like. DEA, for instance, I don't really know what sure. y'all do day in, day out. I just right. I grew up watching movies like Blow, and so it's like sure. yeah. that yeah. you watch those movies and you, you hear those stories. Everything kind of seemed to be centralized around cocaine. But even now you're talking about working in Mexico City and you're – talking about the prices of methamphetamine and when we watch the news nowadays we tend Mm -hmm. to hear this many kilos uh, of meth or now more so fentanyl are busted have you seen a shift away from cocaine into more of a methamphetamine trafficking yeah you you know what's been amazing so i started my career in 2000 and so i've been doing this you know 23 years what was super interesting when i first started was we were coming sort of off the tail end of that real big cocaine cowboy Miami Vice uh, scene, you know, with everything coming up from South Florida, you know, and everybody was in boats and guayaberas and, and, you know, flowered shirts, you know, and uh, bringing up kilos of cocaine from Pablo Escobar himself kind of thing, right? Um, You know, those early 2000s, you just had that shift with meth Mm -hmm. and meth labs and meth labs starting to explode and people trying to understand why they're... um, Allergy or cough medication of pseudofedrin was, you know, now you have to go to the pharmacist yeah. right. to be so able to get it, show yeah. your ID. Exactly. And it's essentially just that, that shift in what the consumer market is wanting. Really? It's a shift in how these drug cartels actually try and influence um, the consumers. You know, just like a regular company might try and influence a certain market to have a chicken sandwich introduced, and, you know, and so they're going to what? They're going to flood the market with some free samples, with some promos, right. sales. Hey, when you buy your burger, get a free chicken sandwich along with it because they're wanting to test that market to see if it's going to be worth their right. effort to shift slightly. Yeah. And if your chicken sandwich happens to be one of the most addictive things on the planet, then <laughs> there you go, right? You know, and so, you, I mean, to, to your point. You know, so these drug traffickers over the course of at least my career, we have seen that shift in, you know what? I'm a Mexican drug trafficker sitting in Guadalajara, Mexico. Let's let's go to, let, let's, let's play off that narcos, right? You know, sure. uh, I'm tired of sort of dealing with these pesky Colombian traffickers that they don't trust me and I don't really trust them, but I'm reliant on them right. to get that cocaine at least up to Mexico where then I have a little bit more control to try and get it from southern Mexico up to the border and across. Well, here comes meth. And I realize that as a businessman, because that's how they think of themselves, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I can actually control more of that entire process myself, and I don't have to rely on these guys. So now I just have to rely on getting the products, the chemicals, the glassware, and obviously I just need to download a recipe on the Internet of how to produce meth, and at least I'll be on my way. So now what they did was they were able to start controlling a lot more of a market. And what did they do? They flooded it. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to make high purity Mm -hmm. meth. I'm going to reduce the price a little bit. And to your point, you know, the addiction is extreme. Right. You know, so now um, I've got people asking for it. Now I can start raising my price. uh, And now I control it. Colombia has nothing to do with methamphetamine from my perspective because I'm controlling every aspect of it. Right. And the transportation routes that I've worked so hard to establish mm-hmm. from the Colombians 
trying to get that cocaine up. I'm just now trading it out for meth, and now I control everything. So their profit margin it just exploded. exploded. It's the same reason. Think of one of our you know, big box uh, internet companies that has everything uh, on the planet that you can ask for that with a couple clicks it'll get delivered to your door. Yeah. You right. know, and without saying that name, think of even how they've shifted as a legitimate company. Mm -hmm. They now have their own drivers. Right. They have their own airplanes. Yeah. Because I don't want to have to rely. Help. They contract. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't want to have to rely on others to try and get my product from point A to point Z. Right. So, so let me ask you, why... If, if that was kind of the the, um, the goal from a business perspective was to to centralize things within their own organization, mm -hmm. not not have to deal with the, uh, out of country people, yep. why would they not seek to uh, say run a cocaine and again excuse my ignorance, but a factory or, or, or produce cocaine in Mexico itself as opposed to creating an entirely new uh, market? One of the biggest things to their advantage that they figured out, and I think they figured it out with meth. And is now translated into now 2023 where, unfortunately, fentanyl has become sort of a household yeah. Yeah. word, right? Is It's all synthetic. So unlike cocaine that comes from the, the coca plant, yeah. right. that you need a certain altitude that doesn't freeze, uh, you need crops, you need land, you need people to harvest it, you need sun, yeah. you need uh, irrigation, water, all of those things. All of those factors that are potentially out of your control. Hmm. You rely on Mother Nature. With a synthetic drug like meth or now a synthetic drug like fentanyl, you control everything within the confines of a warehouse that you rent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the chemicals um, don't require <laughs> sunlight, soil, harvest time. Right. So you've, you've you know, essentially created this artificial environment, this synthetic environment where you can make as much as you want, however you want, with half as many people. And the price and the addictive properties are so much greater that your profit, you know, where you were maybe just doubling your profit now, now you're like quintupling it wow. just simply because you control so much more and you're not reliant on all these external factors. Hmm. You know, so that's, I mean, that's crazy. sort of, it, it, it's sort of a crazy underworld, you know, right. to, to think of, you know, um, just because it exists and... You know, that's where, you know, you spend a few years in the DEA or as a task force officer or even in, you know, a, a police department's narcotic unit like Grand Prairie Narcotics. And you just start to see yeah. everything so different, you right. know, and unfortunately it's on the backs of people who are struggling with uh, with addiction. Yeah, true. Well, you know, I was going to ask, too, you you mentioned a lot of the infrastructure within Colombia, <clears throat> excuse me, that's necessary to, to harvest and, and to produce the, the cocaine. Obviously, I'm, at least I'm assuming Americans tend to be the largest consumers of some of these narcotics. Um, right. As the market has shifted towards uh, methamphetamine, has there been a, a consequence on the Colombian side as far as like increased poverty or you know, reduced money or, or inability to move their product? So a lot of what the Colombians, the, the criminal element in Colombia have done is, okay, well, you know, what, what happens when – this isn't giving you the profits that you've been so used to for decades. You just start looking to see where else you can uh, integrate your product. Yeah. Right. So right now, you know, I would say a whole lot of operations of Colombian cocaine has shifted for a European market. Yeah. Really? And so now you see a lot of Colombian cocaine being sent over. I mean, big difference though, right? got to cross a whole ocean yeah, versus massive. trying to find little, you know, uh, hop steps up to the United States. Right. But in that case, I mean, when you have time and creativity to try and get your product across oh, yeah. the ocean, right. uh, we've seen a lot of investigations and we continue to, to work with our foreign counterparts where Colombian and Venezuelan and Bolivian cocaine is making its way to Africa, wow. right off that west coast of Africa. So mm -hmm. now you've got Colombians sitting in you know, uh, the Western states of Africa or Western right. countries of Africa just to be able to negotiate once it lands there on that ship to make its way up into into Europe. Golly. You know, so that kilo of cocaine, you know, just talking about how that yeah. price changes, yeah. you know, right. I mean, it is significant at that point, but yet, you know, there's a, there's a market for it. Right. Let, let me ask you this. So some people, depending on where you live, like here, you know, back in the States, Oh, we don't have a drug problem because I live in upscale, <laughs> you know, right? 
such and such city. Yeah. What would you tell them? Um, don't kid yourself. Yeah. Number one, you know it. I think, and in, in Hollywood to a degree has done a, a little bit of a disservice over the years. Not so much now, and unfortunately, because there's you know starting with a lot of heroin overdoses that we started seeing about ten years ago, yeah. where it wasn't the stereotypical drug user mm-hmm. who was dying of an overdose. You know, 10 years ago, you'd say, hey, describe to me uh, a heroin addict. Right. And chances are they would um, describe somebody strung out on some public park bench mm-hmm. with track marks, homeless maybe, needle in their arm, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, as, as this evolution of drug abuse has continued over the last, you know, 20 plus years, you saw a shift in opioid addiction, you know, the painkillers, which right. we're still dealing with today. Mm-hmm. And that stereotypical drug user uh, didn't exist anymore. It was now, you know, us talking to uh, a couple middle class, maybe upper middle class parents right. who live in the suburbs who were completely in this fog mm-hmm. because their child star baseball player, Mm -hmm. college in front of them. They live in a gated community. This doesn't happen here. And it's not, it's not even, um, my child was experimenting with marijuana. It is my child just died of a heroin overdose. And it's something that just sounds icky to people. It just blows people's minds. And unfortunately it's, it's been a hard journey for a lot of those individuals to recognize that it is not that other neighborhood's problem. Right. It is not that high school's issue. But well, my kid goes to a good high school, maybe even a private high school. Yeah. Right. Um, it's not the gang infested neighborhood with single parent homes and latchkey kids where, you know, you're having a, you know, you, you hear gunshots at night. Yeah. Right. It is where everybody's gathering at the community pool party. Yep. You know, in the gated neighborhood with the HOA security, you know, running, <laughs> running laps, you know, and that's where it's happening. Well, and that's endemic of, a, of an issue it tends to go back to income level where right. when people who make a certain amount of money start <clears throat> raising hell or having issues or the, their kids and they had they know people. And right. Right. Things tend to get done. No, absolutely. You know, that's, uh, you know, it's it's sort of that weird thing because I've been to plenty of community events where it's like. Finally, you guys are talking about this. Mm-hmm. Finally, it's being raised, you know, and, and we know it because we've seen it, mm-hmm. you know, and we actually uh, joked, you know, sometimes on, on surveillance. You know, we could be surve- uh, on surveillance in maybe not the so nice parts of North Texas, mm-hmm. and uh, we could sit there for hours watching a house and nobody bothers us. Right. Um, we've done some surveillances in some more affluent areas, man, they will call the cops on us in five seconds flat <laughs> because there's a car sitting, right. you know, on the, on the curve that doesn't belong there. Or they've never seen there, you yeah. know? So in that sense, it's, it's, it's kind of funny to us in that sense. Um, but it, it just proves the point that the, the stigma behind people who are struggling with drug abuse needs to go away because it affects, Everybody. I mean, I, I, I did a talk recently where I said, look, Every gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, age is affected. You know, it's it's an equal opportunity killer. And yep. until people kind of recognize that, um, you may not be in that position to think you have to have that conversation right. with your family. Yeah. You know, I read something. I, I couldn't couldn't quote where it was from or even what it specifically was, but it, it was referencing the move away from the need for needles as being uh, such a catalyst for, because it's so much easier to try to pill. Uh, right. You know, a, a kid's at a party is way more likely to say, hey, I'll pop, you know, this pill. Pop a pill. That right. nowadays, you know, yeah. has, at least I, I assume fentanyl has some kind of relation to, to heroin or the, the, those two right. type of downers. Now they're laced with fentanyl and you're getting some of those overdoses as well. And that's the crazy thing about it, right? So fentanyl, heroin, and, and the prescription painkillers, right? The, the oxycodone, the hydrocodone, the Vicodin, the Percocet, you know, all the same family, all the opioid okay. family. So they all block the pain receptors, the opioid receptors in your brain, you know, so it, it completely just kind of numbs your body. I mean, fentanyl 
in and of itself is is a f- actual pharmaceutical drug, right? You know, right. if you've been put under the knife in surgery, chances are you were probably pushed fentanyl in your IV to put you under. Oh, wow. Um, chronic painkiller. You know, so those who are struggling with chronic pain or maybe a terminal illness, you know, they might get fentanyl patches. You know, that's mm-hmm. a slow release. You know, that's dosed in the microgram. You know, yeah. so not even a milligram, right? right. Uh, and to your point, somebody who is curious or maybe not even curious if I were to take out a few pills out of my pocket and lay them here on the table and they were just maybe white pills there wouldn't be room full of cops there wouldn't be that instant whoa no what's that yeah Yeah. you know if I were to do the same thing and pull out of my pocket of this a couple shards of crystal meth right everybody in this room would be like, whoa, wait a minute. Is yeah. that meth? Is that like, is that real meth? Like, did you just put meth out on this table? Yeah. Huh. You take it that so by yourself. That's it, right? Did you check that out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, we've been so conditioned that tablets and pills and capsules are something to help us. I mean, if you have kids or, or, or people listening, they have kids, you know, I bet you at one point all of us taught our kids how to swallow a pill because right. they, you know, they weighed out of that liquid amoxicillin or liquid Tylenol, whatever right. it is. So now, you know, you're sitting there going, here's here's some water, here's this, put it in the back of your throat, you know. And they probably, I mean, I know my parents taught me that, yeah. you know, right around 10, 11-ish, 12 years old. I had to teach my kids when I was ready for them to take There you go. Like, go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I don't know. Can you say that? I don't know. No, it's natural. Know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly the point. So now, fast forward a few years, and they're in high school or they're in college or a young adult. And uh, maybe they're stressed out over that final exam in college or those midterms or their boyfriend or their girlfriend just broke up with them. So they're, you know, depressed and they just, you know, they they just want to chill out, you know, or relax. Guess what? Here's half a pill. Mm -hmm. That's instantly not disarming at all. That, that, That is disarming rather in the sense of it doesn't trigger that, oh, crap, are they offering me drugs? Right. It's normal. Yeah, as the other. It's very normal, yeah. you know, and I think that's what's gotten so many people in trouble. Yeah. There is going to be the the ones that they've experimented with, with marijuana. They've tried other drugs, and so this is just one more step in that process of experimenting with what they think are, are illegal drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some where we've talked to parents, and they say, well, my child only took half. Well, guess what? That half was a pill that was made in a laboratory in Mexico or even some here. We've we've disrupted some pill operations here in North Texas. But guess what? They don't have the the quality control that the pharmaceutical industry does, right? right? You know, if you were to go buy a bottle of acetaminophen mm-hmm. at the neighborhood pharmacy, I guarantee you that somebody who's buying that same bottle in New York City, it's going to be the same. Right. You're not going to even think twice. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing how even pharmacies talk about how, hey, you know, if you're on vacation and you need your prescription, you just go to the local thing and get your prescription transferred. Right. There is a comfort level mm-hmm. in all of us that if we get our pharmaceutical drugs from a pharmacy, there's an inherent comfort level that it's going to be the real thing. Mm-hmm. And even more so that even if we take half of it, it's going to be half of the what you would normally dosage expect. unit, right? Because those companies make it every effort to make sure it's diffused equally. Mm, yeah. These fake pills that contain fentanyl, there's no quality control. Because if it goes wrong and somebody gets hurt, it, who there's, are you there's no to? consequence, yeah, like, yeah. right? Yeah. And how do you know the the half of the pill doesn't contain all of the yeah. fentanyl, right? And the other half didn't contain yeah. anything. Yeah. So it's it's really that kind of education Mm -hmm. that we're really trying to get out to people that unless unless you're taking a pill that comes from your prescription that you went to the doctor that you got from the pharmacy that has your name on the pill bottle Mm -hmm. with the dosage you're supposed to take you can't take a chance anymore yeah right you know we all got good if you have daughters uh or sisters maybe you're you're you know you remember your your parents telling hey you know you know your 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 daughter your sister's out um don't Take an open beer they, uh, or don't a drink, set your drink down. from a bartender, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't set your drink down. Don't yeah. accept it from a stranger, whatever it is. Yeah. We got good at that. And why, right? Because you didn't know what was in it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. It's the same concept with these pills that you can't take a chance. The idea of your buddy in the locker room saying, hey, I know you just busted up your knee in practice. Here, this will help. This will help take the edge off. Right. You can't take a chance that what he's telling you, friend or not, yeah. is the real thing. Yeah. Because right. you just don't know. Do what would you say? And this is for me. I, I just want to know what would you say is like the strongest drug out there, or are they all equally? Nope. If you take this, you're addicted right off the bat. So I have heard from different people. So first of all, I will say fentanyl by far uh -huh. is the most deadliest drug out there right now. It is just simply because of how little you need over that threshold of life and death. Yeah. I mean, it is in the microgram, two milligrams. So uh, public school math here, right? You know, <laughs> so two, two milligrams right. is, is considered a deadly dose. A sugar packet that you find at, you know, restaurant. Mm -hmm. That's one gram. So that's 1,000 milligrams in that sugar packet. Oh, wow. So if two milligrams is a deadly dose, if that sugar packet were actually to be fentanyl, yeah. that's 500 lives in just a sugar packet. Golly. So when you put that into pills, you realize how little it takes to potentially cause a fatal overdose. So from, from a danger perspective, fentanyl by far is the most deadliest. I've heard from an addictive point of view. I've really heard people ask me all the time, hey, well, what's the most addictive drug out there? I said, well, that's going to depend on your DNA and your DNA and my DNA. Okay. Oh, really? Because we've, I've spoke to people who have said, man, I tried meth a couple of times. It just wasn't for me. Like, and you just walked huh. away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then other times you talked to I said, I tried it once. I was hooked, never looked back, yeah. and was constantly seeking that yeah, high. high. So I think a lot of it just goes to our our, our, our DNA, right? You know, and, and uh, the, the hereditary properties of addiction that our families have carried over generations. Right. You know, to where, you know, what affects you is not going to affect me the same, and, and same thing with you. So then... To me, it's not what is the most addictive drug out there. It's what is the most addictive drug to you. Yeah. Right. The bad part is you're not going to know that yeah. until you try it. And then by the yeah. time you try it, yeah, too late. it might be too late. Right. Let's take the caffeine. Yeah. yeah. I was going right? to say, yeah. Yeah, sugar-free monsters. <laughs> That's it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so like I hear um, – People talk about drugs that used to be. So one drug that I was going to ask you about, because I don't know much about it, it, I think it's called LSD. Yeah, yeah, LSD, it, right. Is that making a comeback or is just now only a few people? Or So here's a crazy thing about LSD is it was about a year ago we seized 70 pounds of blotter paper where LSD is put on. Uh -huh. You know, So if you look, you know, you take that piece of paper – uh, they're perforated okay. because LSD, you got to think back, you know, 70s in San Francisco, disco days, yeah. you know, and, you know, these little blotter papers that are nothing more than, you know, not even a, a quarter inch by a quarter inch. Right. And they they drop the LSD onto the paper. It soaks it up. So it's a liquid. It's a liquid. Okay. And you put it on that paper and then you put that paper underneath, you, you know, you, you tear it off. And that's how they sell it, right? They sell it, sell mm -hmm. it just in, in the little tabs is oh. what they call it. Okay. And uh, you put it under your tongue. It gets absorbed that way. People who, I guess, are a little bit more comfortable taking it, they'll actually put it in their eyelid. Oh. So it absorbs into their eye because yes. the idea is for it to get absorbed as quickly as possible. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm in a hurry. Crazy, right? No, that's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> skip the visine, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a hurry. Come I want to see angels now. <laughs> it, right. And it's this hallucinogen, right? And so the bad part about that is it's it's what I kind of categorize as a niche drug. Mm -hmm. Is it widespread? No. Yeah. Is it out there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where we've seen it in, in North Texas, kind of, I guess to me, in my mind, unexpected, high schools. We've seen it in high schools where... People are wanting because it's portable. It doesn't smell like anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can 
drop a tab and um, it's not going to maybe be noticeable in class. Yeah. You know, but like you just said, now all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, there's things crawling on the walls and, and things like that because you're hallucinating. And so, uh, yeah, one of those cases we did, I mean, it was um, a guy out of here. He just got sentenced yeah. that was selling it locally, uh, selling it on the Internet. You know, he was wrapping them up and, and shipping out, you know, packages and uh, 70 pounds. And, you know, one sheet contained over 300 yeah, dosage yeah. units, ah. tabs. It's kind of crazy. You know, so it's, it's, it's like I said, not something you hear about. You know, even like ecstasy, for example. Yeah. What, you know, they, they call it Molly, right? You know, they yeah. call it Molly now. Yeah. You know, ecstasy, believe it or not, that was the very first undercover purchase I made as an agent. Yeah, I was really. brand new, weeks out of the, not even weeks, days out of the academy. And, you know, we all have, you know, like I'm sure the PD has FTOs, right? Field training officers. We have same same thing, right? Field training agents. So my field training agent was working an ecstasy case. He's all right. He goes, let's go, let's go buy some, uh, some X. So an informant set up the deal. And I can remember I bought uh, 50 pills yeah. uh, from a guy. I was nervous as hell. I bet. You know, and. Uh, How old were you? 24. Okay. Yeah, I was 24 when I came on the job. Yeah. And instantly he was doing undercover and then spent the next about eight to ten years doing almost exclusively undercover. Wow. But um, I bought it from this this guy and and uh, set it up and it was I think it was like ten bucks a pill. Yeah. He was giving me a break because I was buying fifty of them. And he hands me the bag and I hand him the money. You know, and, and it was kind of one of those things like do I count the money out for him? Does he count it? <laughs> Do I just hand it to him? <laughs> right? You know? <laughs> so it was kind of that awkward thing. I actually think I did count it out. Like if I was counting out, you know, here's 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, yeah. whatever. And uh, I remember he told me, he goes, hey, look, he goes, these are the, I'll never forget. It. He goes, these are the, the pink biohazards. So they were colored pink and they had the little biohazard symbol yeah. on them. That was the stamp. Yeah. He goes, if someone's taking them from the very first time, you need to tell them just to take half because they're really strong. Yeah. And that was what he told me. And I'm like, you know, can you speak more into, <laughs> right. the, you know, into the microphone? You know, yeah. my neck. <laughs> right? You know, and so uh, um, that has since evolved too because now uh, we actually arrested a guy several years ago where he says, I don't do the ecstasy pills anymore. I just do the powder, which they call Molly. Oh, okay. You know, it's, it's essentially the pure form of, yeah. of ecstasy. Huh. He goes, because I'm a, man, how did he say it? I am a um, responsible drug dealer, and these pills a lot of times are counterfeit. So I want to make sure my customer knows what they're getting, so I'm giving them powder instead. And huh. they can then p- sprinkle it in their drink, sprinkle it in water, sprinkle it in a Coke or whatever else, uh, and I just sell it by the gram or sprinkle whatnot. Sprinkle it in your alley. That's right, you know. But that one, kind of like LSD, is a little niche, you yeah. know. Colleges, so parties. you said that was your first undercover buy. Well, then that was my first screw up as an officer. <laughs> I remember rolling in and the guys were sitting on a car, and so as soon as they saw the police car, they all get up slowly, you know, yeah, walk of course. away. Yeah. And I walk over and I'm like, "Hey, somebody left their bag of Skittles." Oh, man. and I remember taking it and just throwing it up in the air, and it landed on the hood. And I was like, "Man, get your candy, man. Y'all know I'm in there." And I walked off. Wow, <laughs> they're like, ooh, <laughs> like uh, I don't know. I don't is this yeah, candy camera? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who goes to pick it up? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just sat there. That's yeah, funny. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, as far as like working in Mexico City and whatnot. Was that during your undercover phase uh, of work or not? So I was I was in California for the first part of my career, where you know, like I said, started out with that ecstasy and quickly transitioned into. Um, you know, at the time, meth was the primary drug, right? And black really? tar heroin, mm-hmm. you know, so very quickly because of my Spanish, you know, I grew up on the border, you know, so um, it came, the the lingo mm-hmm. and the real casual conversation in Spanish came very natural to me. Right. I, mean, I grew up listening to all of the, uh, the, you know, they call them narco corridos, you know, mm-hmm. the Mexican, you know, the Mexican music uh, that, you know, sort of um, idolizes drug traffickers, you know, so a little bit akin to maybe like gangster rap, right? Yeah. You know, to where there's there's a little bit of this, uh, that's cool kind of thing. Uh, kind of like an outlaw. Yeah. I, I, I grew up with that. Right. You know, that was around me. And so I, I 
very quickly transitioned and being able to communicate and infiltrate a lot of these organizations that were operating in California uh, that were trafficking meth and in heroin. So after going to Mexico City, you know, we don't have law enforcement authority in other countries, right? We're there at the guests of the host country. Yeah. So our, our position there is more as um, advisors. Okay. You know, so in a lot of places, we're able to uh, help through our intelligence, through the cases that we have in the United States, help, you know, the, the host country, wherever we're at, you know, with maybe, hey, look over here, point this, or, or kind of share intelligence. Um, you know, over time, I'm sure one of the next questions is, well, how, how much cooperation, you know, you gotten from the Mexico government or the yeah, Colombian right. government? You know, it really varies. You know, I mean, look, you know, to say corruption exists, I think everyone can with a straight face say, yeah, it does. Um, but I will tell you, when I was down there and even the guys who are down there now, there are still a whole lot of very decent um, cops right. that are just like you and I. We're trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. For a lot of them, it's a calling. Uh, for a lot of them, they want to see their community safer, yep. you know, whether it's in Guadalajara or Grand Prairie. Yep. Right. And they still have that same um, soul about how they approach policing. Mm-hmm. So I, I always try and remind people that, yes, there's yeah. the not so good and the right. flat out bad. But there's also a lot of good too. Yeah. Well, and I've I've always thought that too because Mexico and, and the drug trafficking tends to be so uh, hand in hand in the public right. eye as far as corruption yeah. goes, and corruption by the police. But man, like watching like if you watch again, always go back to movies. Sure. Like you watch movies like Sicario. Yep. They got the 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 guys in there that are doing wrong. But man, can you imagine being one of those guys that puts on a uniform to go do your job like we do in that environment? I mean. God, yeah. you're having to wear a full face mask so people can't tell who you are. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and and for a fraction of right. the salary. Right. Uh, when I was down there, now granted it was it was you know mid two thousand early two thousand mid two thousands, the average entry level federal e- equivalent of a federal agent was making about fourteen thousand dollars a year. God. To be faced with the threat to life that they face. Mm-hmm. Right. Compared to your average federal agent or even patrol officer here, yeah, oh, to make yeah. fourteen thousand a year, no, thank you. Right, but they would do it. Yeah, you know, and so it was. It was always amazing. So, uh, you know, while we had our fair share of operations that got compromised from for some unknown yeah. reason that sure. we could all kind of kind of conclude what happened, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of them that just just like those, right? You know, there's that other movie, uh, Traffic. You know, um, that that one's a good one. That, that you need to add one, that one to your list. You know, it was it talks about sort of that good and bad, and and that cop in Tijuana, mm-hmm. uh, Benicio del Toro, I think played that okay. cop, um, uh, where it was literally just um, just trying to do the right thing, yeah. right, in an environment that wants me to fail at every right. turn. Yeah. yeah, in your tenure as a, you know the agent in charge have you ever seen that though like especially when you was down there where you could say no i saw so and so doing the wrong thing and where you had to ad- you know address it either way or however you addressed it but did you see that firsthand so there was at least one individual pretty high up mm-hmm. that man it just that spidey sense yeah. sometimes that you get with someone just you know just didn't sit right mm-hmm. and um he called me on a Sunday, which is a little off from the norm, right. and said, and we were working this case together, and I had just not a few days earlier had um, passed him some information that I thought they could kind of capitalize on. And I said, man, I'm not too sure what this means, but I think this is something you guys need to look into it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, we absolutely will. And he takes the information. And that was like on a Wednesday. Well, on Sunday, he gives me a call. He says, hey, Eduardo, um, I, I found some stuff on that. He goes, I, I think you're going to want to see this. It's it's pretty, pretty big. I'm like, okay, sounds good. In my mind, come Monday or Tuesday, we'll set up a meeting or, you know, I'll go down there. And and when we work down there, we always work in twos. Mm-hmm. You know, we always, even, even if it was just a meeting, mm-hmm. because we're in a different country, because it's a volatile country, because they don't like DEA agents a lot, you know, right. hanging out. And uh, we always would go in pairs. And um, I said, yeah, sounds good. I said, I'll, uh, I'll hook up with you on Monday. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, can you come down right now? I said, right now? He goes, yeah, right now. 
uh, you know what? I said, well, let me check. Let me check and see if my partner's. He goes, no, 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 no. Just come down by yourself. I just need to, uh, we just need to show you this real quick. You know, and man, everything inside. Right. It was like, this doesn't seem right. Yeah. So I politely declined, mm -hmm. said, can't. Uh, but on Monday, the very next day, right. happy to go down there. Yeah. Never, he was never seen again. He didn't show up for work on Monday. And was gone. And to this day, I have not heard from him. All the police could tell us, or the the agency, was that he um, he had quit. Um, but that was it. It was the weirdest thing. <clears throat> so the only thing I can think is is you know, frankly, I saved my butt a little bit, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. by not just yeah. wanting to check and see, wanting okay, yeah, I'll go down there and stuff like that. Who knows? Who knows what yeah. what was waiting for me? Yeah, you know. So that to me was one of those times where I was like, ah, and it was eerie because he was the he was in the top five of the executive staff there of that agency and just man disappeared. I mean, presumably on his own will, but maybe because yeah. something else was going down yeah. or something like that. You know, but yeah, that was kind of crazy. <laughs> that kind of brings me to, to a question that I wanted to ask too. We were talking earlier about it, um, but as far as DEA lore and history goes. Mm -hmm. um, Kiki Camarena sure. holds a, a very special place within the agency. Um, and the way it's always been explained to me was that basically because he was um, murdered and tortured in as brutal uh, of a fashion as he was, and the the very aggressive response by the U.S. government right. lar has largely given a, a blanket of, of relative safety to our guys working in, in Mexico afterwards. Is that something that, that y'all felt or it was still very much a uh, an ever-present risk? I think that was still very much in, in our minds, you know, that there was, through his sacrifice, weirdly, mm -hmm. and because of that response, you know, and there was even a couple other individuals that had gotten picked up uh, and had gotten beaten up, but then one escaped. Uh, you know, shortly kind of in that, all that mid-80s, late-80s kind of time frame. Um, I think that has helped drug trafficking organizations recognize that there is <laughs> a certain threshold that they cannot right. cross. Um, the sad part is I think that's going away little by little. Right. You know, there's been instances, even just like mine, right? Like, I can't tell you for sure what would have happened if I would have gone down there that Sunday afternoon. Right. Um, I do know that there's been other individuals who've been chased, you know, going home. You know, now, was that mistaken identity? Was that, uh, or intentional? Yeah. Um, right. You know, just like, you know, you, you look back toward, you know, some of the the 1970s and 80s New York mafia kind of days, you know, where you had this sort of weirdly gentleman criminal that, you know, has to ask permission to do certain things and you can't just, yeah. you know, go off a made guy, right? You know, we've right. all watched Godfather, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, just like they've experienced this newer generation that's a little bit more cavalier, a little mm -hmm. bit more I don't care, a little bit more risk-taking. We've kind of seen that a little bit even in, in our circles within the drug trafficking organizations right. where, where you know, the the time frame of Kiki's sacrifices and, and, and what that meant – um, you know, it's, that's history, right? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, um, you know, guys on this job now, you know, they, they read about Kiki, uh, in elementary and in junior high and, right. and didn't live with it. Didn't, you know, weren't around even, even toward the tail end of it. Um, so it's something that you're constantly aware of, right? you know, and, and we just, I think for us, you know, agents like Kiki Camarena and the whole reason Red Ribbon Week you know, the last week in October was because of you Kiki Camarena's. Just a little bit? Yeah, so you know, Red Ribbon Week started because uh, Kiki Camarena's high school in Calexico, mm -hmm. you know, started wearing that to recognize the sacrifice and to recognize and to try and promote this drug-free lifestyle. And it was then, you know, that at the time Nancy Reagan, the first lady, you know, kind of took that and and was able to envelop it into what today we recognize as Red Ribbon Week. You know, and, and so for us, it's a very important week. Mm -hmm. You know, I know a lot of times it's transformed in a lot of schools is um, every day it's a different theme, you know, uh, oh, really? superhero day, uh, crazy hair day, things like that, which is great, you know, but we just hope the schools also hold true to at least the, the root message of, right. 
it's that recognizing that drug-free lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, you know, condemning uh, drug use and abuse, and recognizing the origins come from the sacrifices of, of agents like uh, Agent Camarena. Right. I don't want to go too much into detail on, on exactly what happened, but I would highly recommend if anybody's curious or is unsure <clears throat> of exactly what went down, definitely a Google search will uh, kind of catch you up to speed. And the, the, the show we were talking about before, um, I believe it was the third iteration, I think, the third season. Yes, correct. First season of Narcos Mexico, but the third in the overall right. kind of Narcos uh, yeah, they, series. they mm -hmm. followed kind of him in that investigation. And, Correct. Yeah. And they did a pretty good job. You know, yeah. there is still a lot of um, there, there's still a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to who exactly who, what, where led right. to that, who ultimately was responsible. We definitely have, you know, our investigations, you know, where um, the, the Caro Quinteros, in particular, Rafael Caro Quintero, who is now back in custody in Mexico awaiting extradition. Um, to the United States for I don't think I knew that Agent Camarena's murder. Yeah, so he was he was in prison. Mm -hmm. um, he was released um, abruptly, like El Chapo style, or like actually no released by a state judge because of some technicality, technicality. that they identified. Wow. Uh, he's in his eighties, you know, but they have since um, you know identified him, and we're we're seeking his extradition because you know, look, you know, you mur met, murdered a federal agent. You know, we, we want to be able to <clears throat> seek justice mm -hmm. yeah, there's for no him and the family. Limit. There's no time limit. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, the, for that, there's also, you know, um, th there's also a couple of great stories. You know, you've got Narcos, obviously. There's a book, uh, you know, she was a, a Dallas Morning News reporter for a long time, Elaine Shannon. Um, she wrote a book called Desperados, and that really tracked um, Kiki's story. And that one was actually a, a very good um, historical sort of timeline for that. And I think actually is is an important read for all cops, for, for just law enforcement in general, just to see the links that people will go to, unfortunately, protect yeah. their money. Yeah. 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 I want to ask you, so if you're working somewhere else, like, you know, in, in Mexico or Mexico City, the Americans that work over there, do y'all have a special place where you call home? Because I couldn't go to sleep if, it, you know, <laughs> if it's not gated with some tanks outside. Because, you know, you're always scared that somebody's coming Of course. In. Right, right. So, you know, it depends on the country. Yeah. You know, every country's a little different. But we fall, uh, you know, when we go there, we're, we're guests, number one. Mm -hmm. um, the State Department has the, the first and foremost sort of authority on behalf of the United States government in a foreign country. Right. So ultimately for us, we we fall under the guidelines that the ambassador and the State Department have set up for each country. Okay. So for us, a lot of times, you know, um, what what might be the same sort of security measures for a diplomat hmm. under the State Department are going to be the same for us. For so for like example, in, in Mexico, when I was there, um, you know, we had a variety of, of employees staying either in condos hmm. or in freestanding homes. You know, but there had to be uh, baseline security measures that had been set forth by the embassy to make sure all the employees were safe. So, for example, you know, um, a security guard, mm -hmm. a gated community. Like I, I lived in a home, mm -hmm. just a single family home, mm -hmm. and it had this huge iron gate in front. Yeah. So my entire front yard was within a gate okay. that I had the control to, right? Yeah. A wrought iron on the bars and yeah. doors. Uh, we had a radio that d regardless of where you were in Mexico City, you could communicate with the Marines at Post 1 at the embassy. You know, if it was a... Oh, they didn't live with you? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Right? <laughs> Put them in the uh, backyard. You know, and just some, some overall securities, alarm systems. We actually had a, a, a hot wire, uh, an electric fence yeah. surrounding our property. You know, that... Um, I felt pretty good with that. You know, it was, it was, it was pretty good, and I knew it worked because uh, we had our... Uh, when, when we first moved there, we had our um, our cable guy yeah. come and install a satellite, oh. you know, to, to for so we could get TV just like right. anybody moving into a new place or getting all these things done. And and uh, I didn't know where the off switch was oh, no. to be able to control <laughs> the, the electric bad. fence. That's bad. And so I told him, I said, "Look, the fence is right here. You know, just be careful. You know, it was on the roof line and it was on our perimeter and things like that." And he says, "No, I see it. I see it." You know, so I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I hear, "Yeah." You know, he <laughs> backed up right into it. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, at least the note works. It works yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Now, you you mentioned 
uh, as far as depending on what country you're in. And I think that, that brings up kind of a common misconception I know that I have. When we think about the DA, I think about Mexico, Colombia, sure. Venezuela. Uh, where all does the DA work? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so we are the largest U.S. law enforcement presence overseas. I did not know that. You know, so we have more offices and, and more people in more countries uh, across the globe. And so, you know, some of the 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 very sought after spots are our spots in Europe, of course. Right. You know, we've got offices in Lisbon, in Madrid, in, in Paris, in Brussels, in The Hague. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, London, of course, Rome. Um, so, yeah, those spots, you know, one of my real good friends on this job just got the, the, the special agent in charge job in Europe. Wow. So he's a, he's headed off to to Brussels, yeah. you know. So I said, How "Hey cool man, you know, you, you need me to come and talk to your staff about something, right? right. You know, yeah. <laughs> and then joking around <laughs> with for them. six months. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and then of course, uh, you know, in Asia, yeah. you know, uh, we've got offices, which is crazy, you know. But we've got us in Bangkok and Chiang Mai, uh, in um, Cambodia, yeah. in Laos, in Vietnam, Korea. Uh, and are all those primarily in a an advisory type of role, or is there an interdiction all aspect to it as well? So certain countries might give us a little more slack, and, and we might work a little closer. Like for example, in the Bahamas, I, I joke. You know, one of our actually uh, that would be my pick. You know, well, the funny <laughs> thing about it is one of our one of our assistant special agents in charge here. You know, was assigned to the Bahamas. So we joke with him that he really didn't have a foreign assignment. <laughs> right. You know, he, he likes to say, I was I was foreign. I'm like, bro, you were in the Bahamas, you know. <laughs> you know, but yes. there, you know, they'd work with uh, hand in hand with uh, DEA, the United States Coast Guard and the, the Bahamian police and their Coast Guard, mm-hmm. you know, to do a lot of interdiction of the, the vessels. Yeah. You know, the I was going to say, because I've seen like little, I've seen videos Absolutely. of that where guys will yeah. hop on the, the submarines. Yeah, and so we've got a great um, interchange where our guys are out there doing the same thing hand in hand with some of those local counterparts. You That's know, same awesome. thing, you know, historically, you know, we've done a lot of stuff in Central and South America too. You know, and it's all with the the permission right. of the host uh, host nation, you know, to be able to do that. Other countries were very much um I won't say restricted, but very much in an advisory intelligence sure. role. Um, you know, being able to take the intelligence that we have and share it with them, and vice versa. Right. You know? mm-hmm. hmm. And we even had, uh, up until the war broke out, uh, we had uh, offices and agents in Moscow and in Kiev. Yeah. You know, the war Ukraine, being the most recent The, the Russian and Ukraine war, right? Oh, wow. You know, we were on one of the last helicopters that left uh, Kabul, you wow. know, when the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan. So we've kind of been, uh, we're all over, yeah. you know, um, some spots better than others, yeah, sure. you know. Uh, but um, I think that's, a very unique thing about our agency and for guys and gals who are interested in, in law enforcement and federal law enforcement, um, but have a little of that extra sense of adventure of that mobility. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great, a great opportunity because, you know, I've seen parts of this world that I would have never seen had it not been, but for the opportunity to be an agent. That's what I was going to ask is from the perspective of not just, I guess, a civilian, but also even uh, say local law enforcement, like KD or I, if you were to look at getting into to federal law enforcement on the, on the DEA side, ha, like for me, having a family, hearing a, a foreign assignments like that sounds awesome. It also sure. sounds very like early 20s-ish. <laughs> so it can be a little intimidating. Right. That, you know what? You, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the A lot of our folks that seem to be most apt to yeah. take on that sense of adventure, mm-hmm. they are in their mid to late 20s. Uh, right. their, their kids are maybe still young. Right. Um, they've got a spouse on, on either side, whether it's a husband or a wife that, you know, their job is a little bit more mobile, right? you know, or they're a stay at home parent, you know, to where, uh, yeah, that's great because guess what, you know, you go, let's just say even to Bogota, your schooling is paid for, you know, so you get to go to one of, you know, it's always some of the best private schools really? and that's part of the benefits, right? Um, you know, your your children and your family exposed to just another culture living outside the United States. You know, I tell you what it does. Uh, and, it, and even for myself, you know, I'm, I'm a first generation uh, U.S. born. You know, my family's from Mexico. My dad was born in Mexico. Um, you know, so still very close to my Mexican heritage in mm-hmm. that sense, but still very proud of the fact that I'm American and was born in here in this country and, and all the opportunities that this country has given me. Right. 
But I think when you live outside of the United States, more than just the one week vacation in Kabul, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. At the all inclusive. Yeah. When you live there, you can just appreciate so much more living or being an American or being in, you know, the United States. Um, because I think it just gives you just a different sense of the value and the benefit of living in a country like this. And you get to right. recognize why so many other people <laughs> want to share in that benefit, Absolutely. you know, and want to come here you yeah. know, for that reason. Now, for for an applicant um, to the DA, mm -hmm. it, do your foreign assignments, are they, are they typically like very highly sought after? So if you want to say if you were someone who's more like in one of our situations where sure. we would want to stay stateside, is that more of a possibility yeah. or, or no? So they they cannot DEA can't force you to an overseas spot. You have oh, wow. to select it, okay. right? You know you have to apply for it. You know um, there might not be very many applicants to go to Haiti, <laughs> but right. there's a whole ton that want to go to Rome, for sure. right? Yeah. Um, but as far as domestically, DEA has shifted because we've recognized the workforce and the applicants have shifted a little. Before uh, you apply to the DEA or you even applied to some of our sister agencies, FBI or ATF, they didn't tell you where you're going. You signed a mobility agreement, and about halfway through the academy, they said, "Here's your um, give. Here's the options for your cities. Uh, give me your top three. Yeah. So at the end of week three, I got my list, and I selected. Uh, it's funny to think of it now. Um, Corpus Christi number one. Mm -hmm. uh, Houston number two. Mm -hmm. Houston's the worst. And Los Angeles number three. I hired out of L.A. You know, I was living in California at the time. Yeah. Um, so I was sense. like, ah, yeah. I, I know that beast. So I'm okay yeah. if that's my third choice. Um, that week later, they come with the assignments. And my class counselor comes in and says, hey, Eduardo, I'm just going to tell you straight out right now, you didn't get any of your top three. <laughs> <laughs> you're, go you're going to Lufkin. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, uh, well, I mean, one step up. I went to Bakersfield, California. <laughs> you know, so all I knew of Bakersfield was Dwight Yoakam sang about the streets of it. And that right. was about it, you know. Uh, now, um, you don't sign on the dotted line to become an agent before they actually tell you this is where you will go. Oh, wow. Huh. So it gives a lot of folks a lot better sense. Yeah. And there is a little process through it. You know, they'll give you some choices. You know, you say, hey, here's my top seven. They'll come back and they'll be like, okay, now pick from these top four. And then they'll be like, hey, out of these top four, this is where you will go. Sign here. So you hmm. get that chance hmm. at the very end of the day to say, hey, you know what? Mm, if this is where I'm going to get assigned, then okay. thanks, but no thanks. Right. You know, because unfortunately, what has happened is what? You know, you get to the academy, you get that assignment, yeah. you know, you and, and wifey have agreed, oh, we'll go anywhere, we'll go anywhere. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're making that phone call saying, hey, we're going to New York City. Right. And she's like, uh, you might be going. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they quit. Yeah. So, unfortunately, you lost a spot that could have been for somebody who would have gone. Yeah. Right. Let alone the amount of training and the price and all that stuff right. that we have already invested in you. Yeah. So we've adjusted to it. We're really in a big hiring push right now. Really? We're trying to um, get to 100% staffing over the next couple of years. We're down almost 700 agents. Wow. It's a problem for law enforcement. How many agents do y'all staff? We try and hover right around 5,000. Yeah. Wow. Know, so being down 7, 000, 700 out of 5,000. It is a lot. Yeah. Right. Wow. And so we're trying to be really adaptive to the changing market. Right. You know, I mean, we've had applicants come and say, hey, look, if I apply to DEA, can, can I uh, telework? We're like, how do you be a cop <laughs> and work from home? Right. <laughs> so we had to adjust to some of that, you know, the, the mindset of right. some. And, and no, you cannot telework as a right. DEA agent, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, from that sense is just – Adapt to that and still keep our standards, right? you know, but be mindful of, hey, look, you know, here's this guy who is applying. He's 26. He's recently married. Maybe he's got a toddler. And he says, man, I don't really want to leave Texas. Right. I'd be okay maybe leaving yeah. Dallas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but, man, if I could stay close by, if that helps us get him across or her across the finish line, yeah. then it's a win for the agency. Right. You know, we just had that happen. We had a guy here 
who uh, was offered Seattle, Philadelphia, and um, Sacramento. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he basically he said that. He says, look, I, this is what I want, but I can't do this. Right. I'll take anywhere in Texas. Well, look, there's some hard-to-fill spots here in Texas. Yeah. So guess what? He, he's, he's going down to the valley. Yeah. Right. And he's okay with that. And we're okay with that. Yeah. They need agents down there. And we didn't lose him to nothing. Right. right. You know, so that's what we've been doing. So that, that brings up a question for me as far as, say, being in Texas versus New York, Philly, Seattle. You, there's a lot of differences between those different Huge. locales. Huge. So anything from income tax to mm -hmm. gun laws, and those are just the two big ones I can think of that might affect law enforcement. Uh, is there a, a blank, a big federal umbrella that covers your guys, or, or no? Is it you, are you subject to the state laws? No. So I mean, as a federal agent, you know your jurisdiction and the the laws when it comes to that is the United States. Right. So that's the nice thing about it, right? You know, um, in terms of cost of living and stuff like that, there are cost of living adjustments. So the same agent that graduated the DEA Academy that is going to Yuma, Arizona, mm -hmm. is going to be making less money uh -huh. than the agent who got assigned to San Francisco. You know, so there's a little bit of cost uh, a living adjustment that is helpful. Yeah. Um, you're still on the same pay scale. Right. You know, it's on <clears throat> a, the general service or the GS schedule. Um, but ultimately, there's those cost of living adjustments, and every every place is different. Um, you know, when it comes to to the gun laws and things like that, I mean, essentially, you know, your your status or your authority as a federal agent sort of supersedes all of that. You know, so there aren't any issues there. You know, okay. and and like for us, you know, we we carry our guns on airplanes. You know, we just have to show right. our credentials. You know, there's a, a, a small process that we go through. But, you know, we're required to do that. We're required to, to carry our gun at all times, you know. Now, there are certain venues, right, that, you know, if you're on vacation, right, you know, and you're walking into Disneyland with your family, you right. know, there, there might be some adjustments there, yeah, right? You, really want you know, to, yeah. but otherwise, you know, the, that authority extends across the country. So it makes it nice, you yeah. know, and, and um, I mean, it's, you know. D despite the bumps and bruises of a law enforcement career, I, I still feel, and I know I'm biased, but, you know, DEA is one of the best options for federal law enforcement. Right. Yeah. You know, we spent so much time talking about what you actually do, which is usually the opposite of what we, we I do. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I didn't even really get to get into it or ask you, yeah. like, I guess, how, many, how exactly how long you've been doing it, how long do you plan to do it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, you know, um, you know, for me, it was, it was a little interesting. My, my dad started out uh, as a firefighter. Um, did 10 years there and then jumped and went to the police academy Okay, uh, back in New Mexico. I'm originally from New Mexico. And, you know, that area where I'm from, um, the the police departments are so small, so they don't have specialized units, mm. right? Just pretty much patrol, yeah. right? right? Um, so the, the district attorney investigators are the ones who essentially were the detectives for all the police departments in the area, you know. Um, state police had theirs, and then it was the just DA investigators, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, so Dallas County has them, you know, uh, Colin and, and Tarrant, they all have DA investigators as well. But where I grew up, that was like the bread and butter. So that's what he became and ultimately covered all kinds of different crimes. So yeah. you know, he did undercover. Next thing you know, he's doing white collar. Next thing you know, he's doing homicide. So I grew right. up with that. Yeah. My mom was a school teacher. She later became a principal and then later an assistant superintendent. So I became, you know, surrounded by a family of just essentially public servants. Mm -hmm. But growing up on the border, um, you you knew whose parents were running weed or cocaine right. across the border. And why? Because the kids you went to school with yeah. had the nicest cars, the newest Jordans, right. and the loudest stereo system. Yeah. So in my hometown, you know, cruising Sonic was a big deal. <laughs> You'd cruise Sonic. <laughs> And whoever had the loudest stereo system, you know, that, those, those are kind of the guys who could puff their chest up a little bit. Right. Yeah. And, you know, for me, you know, very middle class family, you know, public servants, right? Dad's a cop, mom's a teacher, right? Right. Um, you know, you looked at that and you were like, you know what? Screw you, man. You didn't get that money, honestly. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it was this, that sort of building up. And to be honest with you, you know, movies at the time, you know, that, that had that, you know, um, cat and mouse between drug dealers, mm -hmm. Kiki Camarena, all of that stuff sort of led that. So I knew when I went to college that that was something that I wanted to seek out. Yeah. 
you know, and so uh, I was very fortunate. I graduated college. I actually started law school yeah. in, in L.A. Oh, wow. Um, and my first year of law school, I had applied to the DEA. I said, you know what? Let me just throw that line out in the water and see. And they bit. Yeah. Wow. So I left law school. Um, left law school, left all those loans behind. Right. <laughs> know, right? And, uh, and never looked back, you know, and, and, and here I am uh, 23 years later. Wow. You know, so I've got a few a uh, few more years, you know, a little uh, gas left in the tank, you know. Um I I enjoy what I'm doing now. I think there's there's a lot of influence that I'd like to, and I think positive influence uh that I'd like especially to to give to some of the the younger guys. Yeah. Right. You know, I always tell our folks, you know, I had and I'm sure you guys have and then you will have is someone 5 year about 5 years ahead of you mm-hmm. that you've kind of watched and mm-hmm. you know, maybe a mentor, maybe they, they knew they were a mentor, or maybe you're just kind of watching, mm-hmm. you know, the good decisions, the bad decisions they make. Um, eventually, you're going to have someone five years behind you right. that you can act for that. So for me, it's very important because I've been uh, benefited from somebody five years ahead of me that I've been able to watch and learn from. So I'm trying to do that for some of the folks five years behind me to do the right. same thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So do you see yourself continuing to, to move up? You know, really, there's, <laughs> in a weird way, there, there there's not a lot left uh, above. Wondering. Right. You know, it would require um, going to our DEA headquarters, right. you know, up into some of the executive leadership there. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's only there's only a few spots left there, you know. And at this point, point, um, I, I like to see myself more as a, a little bit more of a, a, a field general, mm-hmm. you know, where I can use my experience and, and – some of what I can offer to the field yeah. uh, of DEA versus headquarters per se, you know, but you, you never know what God holds, right? You know, right. so That's I just right. uh, kind of take it for what it is and just very happy to be where I'm at. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Deal. Yeah. You want to go ahead and wrap it up? Uh, sure. So uh, before we get out of here, um, listeners, don't forget grandprairiepolice.org. Um, I know uh, we're going to have some information being released as far as next test and exams and stuff, so uh, be on the lookout for that. Also, our social media platforms, go ahead and list them, Nate, because I'm not good with that. I can't believe you don't know them yet. <laughs> so it's all, <laughs> it's all, uh, all going to be GPPD podcast, mm-hmm. or in the case of Twitter, I believe it's uh, GPPD uh, underscore podcast. Yep. So. Well, I really appreciate it, man. This yeah. been, no, uh, it's been great. Yeah. No, no thank you guys. It. Yeah, it's been awesome, it, man. I, yeah. Uh, I had a list of like seven more questions I want to ask, but yeah. I can tell, <laughs> whenever I see his, him start facing me, I'm like, I don't know what the time is, but I know I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm there. <laughs> no. All right. We well, appreciate we appreciate it. it. That's next time, guys. Yes, sir. Sounds good.